Hello everyone. Hi. I'm Ilaria Puripurini. I'm the High School Arts Director here and it is my great pleasure to welcome you in this rainy evening to this event. The event is part of Justin Randolph Thompson exhibition at the British School of Rome that for the ones of you who haven't been it is really a great show and we will see a silent film with some sound performance so please have your phones off during the duration of the event and after Thadi, Justin and Greg will be in conversation and there will be opportunity for questions. I'm going to briefly introduce each of the artists and speakers and then leave it to you. So Justin Randolph Thompson is an artist, cultural facilitator and educator based in Italy and in the US since 1999. He's the co-founder and director of Black History Month in Florence and the Recovery Plan, which some of you know. He has won different awards, among which the Creative Capital Award, the Italian Council and the Louis Comfort Tiffany Award. His work and performances have been exhibited widely here at the American Academy, at the Whitney Museum, at the Centro de Arte Reina Sofia. His work is in the collections of the Studio Museum in Harlem and the Museo Madre in Napoli. Thadi, who is also known as San Barretto Gardoso Bertoldi, is a sound artist and musician. He has worked as a session musician with several Italian and European record labels, ranging from pop, rock and jazz to also experimental electronic music. Sadi is actively engaged in the composition of soundtracks for performances and productions of contemporary dance, theater, installation in museums, and collaborations with artists like the one you'll see tonight. And lastly, Greg the Queer is an independent curator, writer, and translator who lives and works in Belgrade in Serbia. He works as a member of the selection committee of the International Short Film Festival in Oberhausen, and a lecturer at the University of Mainz, both in Germany. He has also collaborated with the Locarno Film Festival, the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, and the Flatterty Film Seminar in New York, amongst many others. So a warm welcome and have a good evening.
just go I'll just be standing in I'm gonna be standing in a safety zone Sometimes I have to stand alone When your so-called friends deceive me Cause me to weep and moan I remember what my mother told me Heaven is a place we own So when your soul comes down to heaven, got to stay in the safety zone, standing in the safety zone. Sometimes you got. Stand alone, but if you, if you want to get through the heaven, Lord, you got to stand and save your own. I'm, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> How do we follow that? Buonasera. It's good to see you all here. It's good to be next to you. Thank you for inviting me. My name is Greg. I'll do my best to sort of start tying things together. Um, oof, that's a lot. Standing alone in a safety zone. We, we don't have enough time for that. And as you can see, silent film is not so silent. It never was historically, but that's a different story. Um, Sadi, thank you for this, this brilliant musical intervention. Scratch that, I shouldn't say intervention. You actually live scored this film. I learned a few things tonight. So didn't know that this film was constructed specifically to be live scored. I like that moment of seeing in the credits sound by U2, <laughs> you know, the performance by U2 as a premiere sort of performance. That's really, that's really beautiful. And I love the way that you, that you two just sort of just, how you just interact with each other sort of sonically. Um, 
Yeah, there's so many things that I would love to talk about in terms of sound, in terms of music. Uh, we can get to the film, I guess, eventually, but I, I think we should probably stay with, with, with sound and, and, and music for the moment, if we can, before we move on. Um, so now I know why you needed that electric grinder. <laughs> And silly me, here I was thinking that you were going to build something. I mean, but, you know, you built something, obviously, sonically. So maybe the first thing we can talk about is just this, this total assemblage of, 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 of musical styles and, and musical cultures and, and objects, this wonderful blend between moving from blues to music concrete and, and sort of experimental tones and, and everything in between. So I don't know, I don't want this, and you probably don't want this, and I'm sure you all don't want this to be a question and answer session. It won't be that. But I mean, I do have a few questions and hopefully this can be like a free flowing discussion. But the, the first thing I'm just curious about is your, both of yours, we'll, we'll bring you on to also sort of get into your thoughts about this, but just just the way you perform and um, how you improvise with the film, I don't know, maybe you can just speak a little bit about the the selection of, of sounds and, and instruments and, and voices. No, so um, first off, thank you. Um, I know that for me transitioning from performative world and language into this one, is, uh, is not easy ever. Um, I, I usually avoid that transition. But uh, here we are, and I think that it was really important. I'm really grateful to have Greg here, who I've been in dialogue with Greg for quite a while, but never in real time. And, um, you know, sound, um, the, the way that I have, have always approached sound personally um, is to sort of, keep it away from the world that I know of music. Um, I'm, I'm a musician, I, I write songs, I play songs. But for me, it's always been important to keep that as a separate world than, than, than the bag or the world I dig into when I'm, I'm, not, when I'm thinking about sound. Um, the, the parameters for me tend to disappear. And most of what I do is to rely on people that I'm in dialogue with. So. Um, this is not the first time that, that I've performed with Saadi. Um, fortunately, we've been on this journey for a minute, and that journey is through dialogue around sound, around feeling, around environments, around historical context, around all these layers. And then it's really, as most of my collaborations are, it's really just, I know that Saadi brings something here that needs to be in this space. Uh, and you all might not know that, but I know that. And so I don't have to predetermine what that is. Um, my role tonight was, uh, 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 I liked how uh, Sadi said it was like a, a didascalica, which is like a, like a title card, right? So it's like, okay, there's sky, so there's thunder. Okay, so there's grinding, so there's grinder. So I was trying to be as basic as I possibly could be in order to really make sure that the focus was on all these atmospheres and textures that Saadi was creating. Um, but in uh, any of these film works, um, they all have live sound that gets integrated into them um, after a premiere like this. So this sound recorded tonight is the sound for this film. Um, and so it's really also taking into account this environment the people that were here, our responsiveness and responsibility to that, um, the energy that's in the room, and how we can capture that. Um, and it's also about including other, other geographies along the way each time. Geographies really like where we are specifically and when is really, really important to um, thinking about what it means to construct an archive that's ongoing. Um, and my relationships to performers is, is fundamental, um, you know. Uh, we, we, this is our way of being together in space, um, and so it's really, really crucial. And um, yeah, so then 
for me, it's also a way that I can experience a film that I've made at the same time as you all experience it, you know? Uh, so I don't get any preview. Uh, we get to just do that here. And uh, probably y'all got the better experience than I did because I, you know, I'm not really seeing it, you know? Um, but um, yeah, there's that sort of trade off of what it means to be actually in the creative moment, like right now, and to involve all of you in that, right? So if somebody coughs, you're in there. Y'all have heard those like piano compositions, and then somebody in the audience coughs, and you're like, oh, and it's there. It's forever there. Uh, I, I like that sort of gesture towards presence. Yeah. Yeah, but also, this, uh, th those are really important points. But, you know, also, I mean, this is live, right? This is a one of one. This film will never be repeated again. This film experience will never be repeated again. So it's special for that reason. We can also talk about philosophical reasons, but we don't want to go there. Let's, but let's stay with film for a second. Now we can sort of intersect because some say, and many say, that film of all the art forms is probably closest to music in terms of the way it's constructed, obviously sort of as a time-based art form. So do you, you sort of, you feel pretty at home as a musician with a film camera in your hand, or maybe more importantly, when you're editing a film. Um, is that, would I, would I be correct in saying that? Absolutely, yeah, because I think, you know, Editing film is about rhythm, right? Uh, it's about knowing what your audience is in front of you and that they will respond in a certain way and having some level of control. So as a musician, I can inject energy into this room and atmosphere, right? And then I can pull that away. And I can dictate sort of what atmosphere is there. And I think the same with filmmaking. But I mean, filmmaking for me uh, really started uh, at age uh, 18 at the University of Tennessee, studying under uh, our, our mutual friend, Kevin Jerome Everson. And it was a camera, a World War II camera, uh, Bell and Howell, with no viewfinder, so you weren't looking through at what you were making. There was no sound, so you were just recording sound separately and hoping you could press play on the tape recorder at the right time. And all of those things are akin to what happens here in terms of Looking, not looking, like what's in front of you is important, but where you are, the environment, the atmosphere is just as important. And then the sonic landscape. I mean, I, I came into film as a painter. Um, that, that's how I was trained. And arriving at film allowed me to express more parts of my being, my creative being, than paintings allowed me to do. Um, and so I could all of a sudden do performance and it would be captured. I could move the camera and think about time and it would be captured. I could introduce sound and music and I collaborate, I've been collaborating with my brother since I was little on sound and music so I could put that in and somehow everything made sense together instead of being these separate parts of the creative being, you know? So it's, it's really coming from that. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of something and I'm gonna misquote him something wonderful artist, a Canadian artist named Michael Snow, who recently passed away, he was multi-talented, known for filmmaking, known for music, for sure, you know, different visual arts, whether they be, uh, you know, whether writing, whether, whether, whether painting. And so one of his thoughts was always, you know, this idea of sort of taking from all these different disciplines and sort of letting them speak to each other and informing each other but also just embracing the fact that, as, as he said, something to the effect of, you know, I, I, I paint like a film, like I'm a filmmaker, and I make music, you know, like I'm a painter, and I, and I shoot films as if, I'm, as if I'm drawing. So this kind of disciplinary clash, um, but sort of embracing this, this fluency or, or disfluency to sort of create sort of something that's, um, you know, that somehow combines all of these parts. But just to, so, uh, add in yeah, yeah, please do, please. I think what, you know, what you're getting at is also, you know, sometimes um, as, as artists, um, we do all sorts of things. And those all sorts of things are not always what everyone's interested in paying attention to. Uh, this is why, um, you know, it's, it's changed a little bit now, but how, why early on when I would apply for an academic conference to talk about research I was doing, the invitation was like, yeah, you should come, you should just talk about your art, you know? Um, there's this ciphering off of, you know, different things that we bring to the table uh, in artistic production, you know, that 
within the artistic production, being able to bring in text, you know, being able to bring in something I, I write and think about, uh, being able to bring in research quite explicitly that I'm engaged in, being able to lean into different aspects of social engagement and community building that is crucial, not only to this film, but to just my being. And I think that that transversing these different um, dimensions somehow is, uh, is really key to embracing and actually appreciating a whole being, right? Uh, and understanding that we're, a lot of people talk about wearing different hats. I don't really, I don't really feel that. I feel like I'm wearing the same hat all the time, uh, or maybe I'm not wearing one, you know? Um, but it's, it's all like everything that, gui if, if, everything that guides and drives thought, performance, work, fatherhood, teaching is the same. It's the same ground, same groundings, the same offerings, you know, uh, consistently. Yeah, yeah, we don't don't let's let's not get started on disciplinary policing. Right, right. Let's not let's not get started on policing in general. I wasn't trying to trigger you on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but let's so you mentioned Kevin Jerome Everson, so we gotta speak about him. His name is in the credits, his spirit is in the film, his teachings are in the film. So when you picked up that camera when you were younger, you didn't just pick up any camera. I know Kevin didn't teach you to just pick up any camera. And every artist, you always have multiple choices. As you mentioned, you could have shot 35 millimeter. You could have shot 16 millimeter. You could have shot eight millimeter. Maybe you could have even shot 70 millimeter, shooting super eight millimeter. So I wanna talk about materials and tools as you kind of evoked with your with your sound performance. So I'm curious to talk a little bit more about the Super 8 camera and, and film stock and what it does for you. And what I'm leading toward, as you know, is what Kevin's all about, materiality. And we see that, that's also really important to you in your film. We see the process of the film. We see the, the making of what we would call in, in film studies sort of the extra diegetic qualities of the film. We see the film stock, we see the, the grain, we can see the sprocket holes, we can see the, the flares, sort of the, the flares between. So maybe you could speak a little bit about that Absolutely. kind of materiality. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I think, you know, with, um, I mean, Kevin Everson really just, in everything that he was teaching, he, he pulled me from what I thought was going to be a world of painting, nothing wrong with that world, but he pulled me from there when I was 18 uh, in a two second conversation. And it, that conversation looked like me walking in the door of the art building the very first time, excited, and him saying, hey. And I'm like, yeah, he's like, you signed up for my classes? And I, of course I didn't know who he was or what he taught, but I signed up for those classes immediately. And so he pulled me from that. And the thing that really grounded uh, his teaching and that grounds my work is that it wasn't about technique. He was like, you know, you have your whole life to develop the techniques that you're gonna use, to refine them, to get them where you want them. It's about content. You know, what's driving the work? Where are you going? What are you thinking about? Uh, because with that, even the funkiest technique, and believe me, my first films, I mean, even <laughs> these films, it's, it's it's a specific kind of non-technical technique. And that's what drives me to, um, I was shooting 16 millimeter in, in undergrad. Um, and you had these restrictions because you had very little time that cost a lot of money. And then you had to take that film, cut it with scissors. And when you made that decision, I mean, it wasn't done, but it was, it should be. You had to be like, that's it. You know, and I think that sometimes being able to go back, even with digital editing, being able to go back, I coach myself to not freak out over like, but if that was, just, I'm like, no, it's all right. And silence helps because if you give me sound, every beat, I'm like, and this is happening there. You know, no matter a little change in sound, that's happening there. And so you get controlling over the medium and the material. But I, I shoot Super 8 um, mainly because I think I'm, I'm very interested in mediums that, like the video camera, that were designed for household use. Um, the camera I used was my uh, wife's grandfather's camera. Yeah. And it wasn't designed for making art. Um, it was designed for home videos, you know, home films. My grandfather shot Super 8 film because it was, you pull a trigger. You don't have to know anything about filmmaking. 
you don't really have to know much at all except how far away you are from something to try to get the distance right. That's all you need to know. And so I really like that, that, that also in a, in a world where we have so many technological options, um, not all those options feel, you know, um, and that's just materiality. Um, the, the bleed of the, the, the side, that one sprocket is always bleeding on my camera. I, li I like that. The dust, the dust that my wife's grandfather somehow accumulated dust in the corners of that camera. It, it looks just like the trees I shoot, you know? Uh, and and I, I, I did a screening in, uh, in March in Alabama, and I was with a, an older gentleman who had run film, cam uh, film projectors, and he said, we never let the white, we ne we're not supposed to let the white show up on the screen. You're not supposed to let that flicker happen. And that flicker is what reminds you that yeah, this, this, is, this is it, you know? Like, we, we just pulled the trigger on this, that's it. It's done. Um, and I, I really like the fact that you can, you can get physical about something that's really ethereal, something that's moving fast, that you can, you can slow it down, you can, you can really tell people this is like, you know, my fingerprint's not on it, but, you know, uh, I'm, it, there's no confusion as like this being some omnipresent vision sitting back somewhere on a tripod. This is, it's, I hope it's clear that this is me pulling the trigger on this uh, most of the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's, it's, yeah. it's also a lot more than that because what you alluded to and what you're dealing with in this particular film and exhibitions and his other films, I mean, you're, you know, you're incredibly engaged with history and incredibly cognizant of the path that you walk. So this camera that your, you know, your wife's grandfather, that cam that, those scratches, those marks, that bears testament, obviously, to where that camera's been, where it's coming from. I don't know where your wife is from, but I'm assuming maybe it's the Florence region. So this is a natural dialogue with everything that you're, that you're dealing with in your film and in your body of work. So, so also I wanted to talk a little bit about that history and, and sort of the way you mobilize it. I want to come back to a quote about history in this film, but before we get there, it, this is a very cryptic film. Um, again, it's not a silent film. The film, even if you weren't here with the sound and everything, this film speaks a lot. This film says a lot. It's a very talkative film, um, but also it's a very cryptic film. You know, we have the titles that are explaining a lot of things and giving a lot of historical context, but we also have, you know, we have monuments, we, ha we have coins, we have mirrors, we have inscriptions, we have codes. Um, and these codes obviously sort of speak to this larger cultural history, but maybe you can talk about this act of coding and encoding as Stuart Hall would say. Yeah, I mean, I think um, um, some, sometimes uh, if, if you're looking at black history um, and you're looking at black history in the Italian context, um, if you go to the official uh, the officially recognized archives, there's material, it's there. You can do that. But if you go to sites where you know shit went down, uh, maybe we don't need to see the archive to recognize what's already present. And, and that's, that's a lot of my thinking. The, the, back, the, the main backdrop for this film is the, the Villa Smith, which is now called Villa La Fonte. Um, in Fiesole, just over top of Florence. And it is the birthplace of this black Florentine resistance fighter, Alessandro Senegalia. Um, he was raised in that house. He played in that garden. I didn't go in the villa because villas, villas can be really hostile environments when you're looking for certain kinds of history. And I don't wanna, you know, I wasn't looking for that hostility in my visit. And so I stayed in the garden. And the garden told me plenty about the life of his mother, who was an African-American, brought as a servant to a white family from Missouri, uh, to Fiesole, because their, whatever their trade was failed. And so they decided it didn't fail that bad because they went and bought a villa outside of Florence. And they decided to bring with them the, the help. And the, that very help, her grandparents were enslaved by that family. You know, so we can think about what the layers of that help looks like. We can think about how she might have engaged that space, how you know, she might have lived that space, how Alessandro might have lived that space in the gardens he grew up in, 
right? Um, those things are there. I know they're there because this is the things we know about life. Um, and so it's really like that's, that's the physical interface, like more than the, the monument of the villa. The villa is like a, a setting where this, this went down and that's the spark, you know, just to use the metaphor of this film for a revolutionary. I mean, like really uh, a, a man who dedicated his life with half his life spent in prison, you know, to liberating Italy of fascism, right? Uh, gave his life for it. You know, he was shot down just before Florence was liberated, you know, in the streets. He got out of prison and went back to work, you know, and I think that these are these things that the archive can tell us something about that, right? The official archive, the official history will tell you something about that. But I think we have to find other ways of connecting to those histories, to those spaces, to these things that isn't reliant on the deciphering that tends to be needed inside archival spaces, you know? So like the, the, those are folk songs. Uh, the Partigiani, the songs of the resistance fighters are just folk songs, you know? Uh, they were designed for masses of people to sing them together uh, to create a certain encouragement of activity that was under fire, you know? And, and so, I mean, as a kid, I, I read all sorts of traditional songs. Like, I, that's a traditional song I was quoting. Um, I read all sorts of traditional songs and made up my own words to poetry. I mean, the, the, the lyrics, but all, mainly the singing. So I would read Langston Hughes as a young kid and sing it, because it's musical. Language is musical. And so I know that as y'all read these words, you could create your own melody. I'm giving you the rhythm. I'm setting the tempo, but you could create your own melody. And so this soundscape that's created that, that Saadi brings to this space, it's carrying you at a different pace, at a different frequency. But then you have this sound you might be generating in your head. If you know, if anyone's ever heard that song in Sorjama, which is also a song that's used today in, in resistance marches. Alessandro Senegalia, his flag is brought to marches today for factory workers. And so the actuality of these histories um, is something I think we, we need to find other ways to grapple with that is not about marble and bronze and letters and yeah, those things. Yeah. And just to, to reiterate, to sort of come back to archives, I guess we should open it up for discussion soon, but obviously archives you know, are not neutral Hopefully we all know that, and obviously archives are, are often defined by what's not in them, or what are the gaps, and um, we always, and always have to talk about the ethics of archiving, right? What gets preserved and what does not? What are sort of resources afforded to, and, and what are they not afforded to? So I can't let archives pass without that, but let's, let, let's say something brief, please say something brief also for those that uh, like me, who, who are very idiotic when it comes to the Italian language, um, the, the sort of the organizing motif of the film, this idea of the parasintele. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of my favorite things about the film, this, as you described it to me, this revolutionary spark mm -hmm. that is either you know, to be contained or to be sort of released somehow. So maybe you can yeah. talk about that, yeah. that sort of structuring metaphor. Absolutely. So I mean, I think you know, in, in terms of the archive, just really quickly, um, a lot of my understanding and interest in thinking about archival material and moving image and film comes from Kevin Everson's whole broad series of taking B-roll film um, from archives and making new stories out of them. And that, to me, was like, it wasn't shocking, but it was exciting to watch, you know, that you can take this and we can make whatever story we want out of what, what's already been told, right? That's just one way to say this. How do we reframe that? Um, and, and that's a, a way also just to understand these stories that emerge from archives as not fixed in place and not definitive, you know, as in need of being updated, even when they're in the right direction, you know? Um, but um, Parashintile is a, um, it's these forms that you use. There's many different ways in which they're used, but they're basically the metal frame that you put in front of a fireplace to keep it from catching your house on fire, right? But there's a specific design of them that has been used uh, 
across Europe mainly, I'm sure it's happened elsewhere, this decorative parashantila, they used to call it like summer parashantila because it's some, the fireplace is not on. But they're like, you know, that whole burnt black spot of the house, that don't look so good. Let's put a decorative, usually embroidered object in front of it. Um, and so the shape that you see Delen, who's a, a researcher at the European Institute, which owns that building that we're at, you know, I brought her up there because I know she's, this is her institution, and they have this history that nobody there's talking about, you know, and she's working on the relationship between um, black women, ritual traditions that connect to nature. And I'm like, you know, this is, let's have a conversation about Cynthia White, you know, Alessandro Senegalia's mother. Let's have a conversation about her right here. Um, but Parashantila, yeah, this idea is that you have this decorative thing that, that, that either hides the, the dirty fireplace or protects you from the spark. And I think that when we think about all of those sparks of thought, of energy, um, yeah, they're, they are also being hidden, you know, a lot of times obscured through the archive. And so, you know, what does it mean to have something in front of all this energy that's there, all that history that's there to have a veil right in front of it that's pretty, you know? I mean, the one that I made is not that pretty, but you know what I mean. Um, and, and to not be talking about what's right behind it. And it's also just being direct, People like Cynthia White, um, also Alessandro de Medici, his mother, we have little to no archival trace. Why is that? What do we do with that? That the person that we know existed because we, we, we give great value to their son. You know, like, what do we do with that? And so I, I think it's also really about that, about like what's, what's behind that decorative veil, you know? So when we can celebrate someone like Alessandro Senegalia, fortunately he's being celebrated, um, but not know anything about Cynthia White, what does that tell us? You know, um, what is the labor of motherhood? You know, um, how does her origin story spark his revolutionary behavior? Right? What is his awareness of Black American culture, and how does that position him? in a context of racism and fascism, colonialism. How does it position him? You know, so these are all things that are behind the, the decorative veil uh, too often. Um, and we're in Rome. I mean, I don't need to explain that to y'all here. I mean, that decorative veil, I mean, and the decorative veil is explicit in telling you those histories, but we don't read them. You know, it's like, we can see beyond it. We can understand the beauty, you know, but not really appreciate how devastating that history is, you know, so, yeah. But, and, and just as a technical note, we should obviously mention, obviously mention, the Parashantile is, is in dialogue with your larger project, which is a, an exhibition at the British School at Rome called Minted in Enemy Bronze. This gentleman's first solo exhibition in Italy, country that he's been living and working in extremely successfully for 20 plus years, 23 years. So congratulations to that. And um, we should mention that for those that haven't had a chance to see the exhibition. So yeah, some of the pieces you that you can see in the film literally sort of appear in the, in the show. They're in it, yeah. And I wanna thank uh, Marta and Sylvia who are here also um, that have been a part of really making that possible, you know, bringing this, this work, which is a practice I've been developing for about 10 years uh, into a space where it can be formalized at least in some way. You know, um, and of course, I really appreciate all of you like hanging out with this this world uh, as well. But yeah, we can uh, open that if there's any comments, reflections, questions, or anything like that. Oh, you got it. It's an open mic uh, night. There's a microphone there. Thank you. I wanted to speak a little bit about the exhibition and some of the works there. When I visited, there is a work where um, you reference as Rapound and a Cantico. And if you could speak a little bit more how you use different bits of history and then mix them into your work. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. I mean, 
and this piece this you know i'm always trying to find space to do things that i have that, that i'm curious about this is actually the first film i've made that has my text in it um, i've never included my voice in that way explicitly but then if we think about 23 years of also writing you know and reflecting that's an archive too so like how do we connect what's going on right now to what precedes us? Um, how do you take language that is maybe more poetic that's happening through an artistic lens and put it in dialogue with literally a letter that Alessandro Sinigaldi wrote? How do you put that in dialogue with a motion that was advanced by a city council member you know, to get a monument put up to Sinigaldi? Like how, how do all those things intersect with each other and give us a helpful understanding of all the activity that's actually happening? But I think you know, with, with Ezra Pound, um, Ezra Pound is responsible for um, bringing me to uh, know the history of Lewis Till. Um, and Lewis Till is Emmett Till's father, um, who was hung by the US military 10 years before Emmett Till was lynched. And um, I would have never known that had it not been for Ezra Pound in a cage on the same military base, writing the cantos and witnessing it and deciding to speak about that, you know? Um, I think, you know, and this is what happens, I think, when we uh, feel the need to completely just set aside um, texts and histories that we don't align with, um, is that there's stuff embedded in that, if, <laughs> as, as harmful as it is to read a lot of Ezra Pound, because it is sometimes, but there's also a whole lot of really wild imagination and thought. There's a substantial critique of the United States of America that uh, you know I, I'm gonna lean into sometimes. So there's always, and anybody's sharing, there's gonna be things that you're, if you really take time and look at it, you might find some things that are significant or of interest also to you. And the, the, the power of film is that I can have you reading that without you knowing at all who said it? And that makes you have a different relationship to what's being said. So you get to determine that relationship. And then if I tell you afterwards and you're like, oh, I hate that guy, it's like, I didn't tell you to like him. You just read his words, that's all, you know? And I think that we, uh, it's too often that we would avoid reading those sources that we're against. Um, so Ezra Pound is someone that maybe a lot of people might be avoiding for his fascism, for his racism, for all of those things. But I think that in order to embrace complexity, um, in order to really position ourselves in relation to history, you got to recognize that all this stuff is happening at the same time, all the time, you know? And it's not like there's a lack of awareness of these connectivities, right? Um, Ezra Pound's letters to Langston Hughes, right? What, is, what do we make of that? Like, what do we do with that, right? And I think that when we abandon the individual completely based on a non-alignment, um, yeah, it just seems like a misstep uh, to me and an opportunity to sort of, uh, if you want to be critical about something, yeah, read that shit and be like, this is garbage. You know, if that's what you've got to say, you got to read it. You know, and in a place right now, like Italy, and I'm sorry to go on about Ezra Pound, I should leave Ezra Pound alone, I'm sorry. but. In a place like Italy where the Casa Pound, right, like extreme right group, decides that they're gonna be named after an American poet, Ezra Pound, uh, I think that you have to pay attention to where that's coming from. And, and then also pay attention to the fact that they probably never read Ezra Pound, you know? So what are we doing with that? The, the, the fact, I don't know if you, well, y'all probably don't hang out on Casa Pound's website, but they have their own biography they wrote of Ezra Pound. They came up with their own biography because you know they're selecting what they want to celebrate, just like all histories do. They select what they want to talk about, what they want to celebrate, you know? And um, it's important because, I mean, that's, a, that's maybe a radical group, but it's, in, it's now like on the ballot, you know? That's, that's undeniably important, you know? There's a, I, I'm sorry, I should leave Ezra Pound alone. But I have to bring this up because this is really, it should be shocking. It bothered the hell out of me. 
there's a, a, a play, a theatrical play that's moving around right now in Italy. It is called Ezra and Gabia, right? And it's about him being in prison by the US military for in speeches, they say inflammatory speeches on fascist radio, okay? So when I'm looking, I'm like, okay, so y'all are doing a play about him? What? I was like, this is gonna be some fascist shit. It's going to be, no way you could, how do you do it? Like, do they have nuance? Is there complexity? So I, I told my daughter, I said, let's go see this thing. You know, why not? It's the anti prima, you know, let's go see this premiere at the Pergola. It's the first play of their season, the, the most important theater in Florence. It was straight up some fascist shit. I mean, it was like literally, it was, he's, the play starts, and I'm not going to get into it, but it'll be enough for me to tell you this. The play starts with this man, older man, in a cage, saying, I know why you're here. It's to judge Ezra Pound, who has never had a fair trial. And then he goes on for an hour defending, through every means possible, Ezra Pound, defending fascism through every means possible. And this is na nationally touring theater, right? That's setting a tone for many people that don't even know who Ezra Pound is. Never heard of him. It's on Rye Play in case y'all wanna like be disgusted. You know, you can watch it, it's hard. And it's also, yeah, I'm not gonna get there. I'm not gonna go there. Yeah. Sorry, I mean, but I mean, these are like the reason why we gotta grapple with these texts is because these things are relevant, like absolutely relevant right now. If we're gonna talk about resistance fighters, this shit is relevant right now. If we're gonna talk about black resistance fighters, it's absolutely relevant right now. It's not disconnected from the world we're living in today, you know? As, as a really important thing, and thank you for that comment and, and also for the answer. But I think this is, it would be apt to say a, a really important filmmaker once said that there's a ministry of war and there's a ministry of culture. And this is what we're sort of talking about, what's important in, in terms of who's using culture, what are they using it for, who's paying attention, who's not paying attention. And the, the Lewis Till story, well, it was, you were telling me a little bit more about it because I knew very little and it's just, <clears throat> I mean, just the incredible, horrific irony of, of, of life, but I mean, it's just, you know, thinking about him and, and thinking about Emmett and, um, you know, if, if we want to be Marxist about the situation, we could say history repeats itself, right? But when it comes to black people, it's often first time tragedy, second time is tragedy. We can't talk about farce in this instance, but yet and still these, these cycles, these, these repetitions and uh, Ezra Pound, as you say, he's sort of having an awakening, and I don't know about the Italian situation, uh, and you, I know you do, but this, you have to know these things. This is, this is part of the dialogue and part of the discussion that's essential. That, that cycle is tough, especially with the current government that we're looking at in Italy, that they would love that play. I mean, that's gonna give you every tool you need to dismantle any critique of fascism. Like, no, no, but here's the defense. I heard, learned it from Ezra and Gabbia. You know, but I think the cycle you're talking about, I reference uh, 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 Melvin Tolson's uh, The Merry-Go-Round of History. You know, it's about this thing that just keeps spinning. Maybe we change places, and, but it just, it just keeps going around doing the same shit over and over. And that's, that's the whole, Minted and Enemy Bronze is about that. What is that cycle? You know, what, it, what does it mean to melt down your enemy's sculptures, ammunition, and make celebrations of your heroes? What does that produce? Aren't we melting you know? some things down in the U.S. Oh, yeah, right about now? Absolutely. Yeah, what's so, happening with so, that? No, no. <laughs> we won't go. Yeah, it's too much. I know. I know. Oh, and I, I heard about that, and I'm like, yeah, well. But yeah, it, 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 you know, he just just keeps fueling cycles, and we ain't get we. It's been thousands of years, and those cycles. Yeah, we gotta, we gotta find other ways. I'm sorry to bring it that dark place. Sorry, to, Ezra Pound brought me there. I'm sorry, but. Uh. <laughs> okay, yes, Ezra Pound is definitely a complicated figure. Um, and I'll have to watch this play. Uh, Justin, I'm gonna just have a couple of nerdy historian questions. So I absolutely agree with you. We have to wrestle with all the texts. I would be concerned about putting up a piece of Ezra Pound or Julius Avila and not saying who said it. I, I think that could lead to sort of problematic circulation, but 
you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And then my second super nerdy question, but tell us a little bit about Senegalia. What did he do? Where did he fight? A bit about more of his mother, his father, you know, how he, and you had the letter from the Soviet Union. He was in exile in the Soviet Union and came back, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, both of those are really good questions. So uh, just to be clear, in, in the films that I make, I always cite who's written the text, but I tell you later. You don't know when you're reading it. You know at the end of reading it. And so the, the, the defense mechanism of like, you know, refraining judgment, you might be feeling that until you get to the name and you're like, oh shit, you know? Um, so no, it's always cited. Um, and that's really important for me also because I'm, I'm trying to point you to where you can find more information. You know, like I take one line, but there's like books, you know? Um, and um, so Senegalia, I mean, I don't, uh, to, uh, a fast forward through his history um, is that he's born in Fiesole. I think the birthday is 19, the birthday is the date that was on there, 1902. Um, I, I don't know his mother's birthday. Uh, uh, and I thought that at that villa, him being born there would be good to have his birthday with his mother's initial. My daughter embroidered that piece, by the way. Um, and, um, you know, Senegalia is, is born in 1902, and in, in Florence, his father is David Senegalia, who's a, a, a Jewish uh, man from Mantova. Um, and to, to, together, he worked for the household as well. He's a mechanic, electrician, and so he's also just the service, right, at this house. Um, and Senegalia goes on to become uh, very, very linked to, very interested in communism. Um, he goes and trains in Empoli um, as a young man. And he, um, he originally, um, as the situation in Florence and in Italy started to change where he, the people he was in touch with, that he was training with, were getting killed, were getting imprisoned, he decided to go, like many people, uh, to uh, the, the, the Soviet Union and train more uh, politically and militarily. Um, he had a daughter there that we don't have any trace of, but he had a daughter there. And so when he's writing this letter to his father, he's saying we're all fine because he, he's announcing also his, his daughter. We have these letters because the fascist government confiscated them, right? Um, he, um, he returns um, to Italy, but mainly he goes off um, to, the, to fight in the Spanish Civil War. Um, it's one of his early sort of war experiences is that he goes to, uh, to Madrid and, and is, is fighting. And what's said is that when, when it was clear that they were not going to win that fight against fascism, that many of them retreated. He retreated across the French border and was captured and put in a concentration camp. Um, and he was in a concentration camp for many years. Then that concentration camp moved into another concentration camp. And then eventually he's repatriated to Italy where he's put in a prison. Uh, first at Murate, which is a prison in Florence, two blocks from where he was killed. Um, and then he's moved from Murate to Ventotene, which is this, it's kind of like Alcatraz in Italy. It's an it's a island prison. And he spent long, long years and he gets out of there uh, after the fall of the fascist regime, he's released. And um, he's in his 40s, and he decides to go back to Florence. And he's the founder, uh, one of the founders of the Gap Movement. And the Gap Movement was this covert guerrilla movement that in a Nazi-occupied Florence, they would go and set bombs under the spaces that were occupied by Nazis and blow them up. And because this was covert, Right, you you couldn't even ride bicycles in Florence, and it was like really on lockdown. Um, they he made his move the way he could, but as a a black Italian, you know, he couldn't really go under the radar in the same ways, you know. And if you think about racial laws and everything else, so he was he was identified, um, and when he was identified, um, they, they they shot him. And uh, in 1944, he gets shot in Via Pandolfini. And just to tell you the, like, the, the, the nature of uh, those inv individuals involved in occupying Florence, uh, he's, he's shot down by the Banda Carita. Um, 
and they, they take his gold teeth. You know, just like, so it's like, it's not really about just killing the guy. And that's not a souvenir of this. It's just like gold, right? Um, and after his death, um, uh, amongst the Partigiani, uh, the Brigata Senegalia is formed. So they create a brigade in his name. They, sing, they say that they sing songs in his name. It's contested. And I, I love the fact that the archive will never actually tell us if that was true. You know, I love this hypothesis that we don't know, but I'm cool with it. Yeah, I'm cool with it the other way as a prison song, cool. But I'm cool with it also as a song that was written by a composer for Senegal, yeah. Um, and to this day, there's a plaque that was put in that street right where he was murdered in the 1960s by Ampi, uh, Resistenza Fiorentina. And every year on the anniversary of his, his, his death, um, they do a commemoration. They go to that site, they put a new wreath on that plaque, they sing these songs, they give speeches. I've given, not speeches, but I've intervened um, as a way of trying to make sure that we can try to get some younger folks involved in that history, because it's, it's currently, yeah, I don't know how much longer uh, that's gonna be able to go on in the way, that, in the form that it has. You know, and I think that young people recognize the value of fighting fascism and the value of non-white folks fighting fascism in Italy. I think people recognize the value of that, but somehow getting that energy around the preservation of that memory, not you know, the monument, that the, the plaque, that's fine, but it's not preserving that memory. It tells you that he was brutally murdered. That's the only thing you know if you read that. So what do we do with his life, right? Most of which was spent in prison. It's not like if you read his biography, he has a biography. I'm very hesitant in pointing you guys to it. It's, uh, it's written by a very important um, sociologist who's brought a lot of black Italian history to the fore um, named Mauro Valeri, who's now come to pass. Um, and um, unfortunately, Mauro chose a title that, that uses what is now a racial slur. And I thought it was to be provocative, but it's used throughout the book. So it's like, bro, like, you know, and he's an anti-racist fighter, but that book, I can't suggest it to people anymore. You know, I can't give it to the people that need to be reading his history. And this is a real dilemma, you know? Uh, I, I have a hard time reading it. It's hard to digest and it's important history. Hard to digest, you know, just one word, and it's like, oh my God. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's his history. You can read his biography if you try not to tell your librarian that you're looking for, for that title. It's like the book on Alexander Senegalia, you know, and then they might say the title, and you'd be like, that one, yeah, you know, yeah, it's tough. You know, so these are also these things I think we need to spend some time with because uh, Mauro Valeri is a part of a huge networks of anti-racist activism, super important, bringing to the fore so many black Italian histories that are little known, Leone Iacovacci, Domenico Mondelli, like these are not household names and he's brought to the fore in a contemporary way these biographies, but that book was a misstep, uh, unfortunately, a uh, big one. Uh, I think I told his son. <laughs> it's like Ezra Pound and Lewis Till, right? I mean, like, what's the, what's the benefits and losses? Any other questions or thoughts? Everyone's getting hungry. I, I just, so just one more comment, at least for me, hopefully I, it won't be the last one, but just thinking about this commemoration and, and the laying of a wreath so an anti-fascist black fighter, you know, song sung and public. I don't know how many people go to these, these commemorations, but about twelve annually. About twelve annually. Usually the same twelve. Yeah, but it's there. It's in a public space. There's a plaque. There's actually a, a, a marker, which is, you know, for me, for someone that doesn't live in Italy, but for someone who knows a whole lot about being black in Europe, right. that means something. And we're here in the American Academy, right? 
what would the corollary be in the United States? Do we have something? Where's the need, or, or what, what would be the, the equivalent of, of a public space dedicated to a staunch anti-fascist, and however many people coming to celebrate that man, that life, and to try to light that spark for future generations to continue celebrating? Where is that? What do we, we need that, obviously, but what are we close to it? I'm not saying at all that Italy is a perfect country, because it isn't. <clears throat> no country is perfect, but still. That's a yeah. spark that kind of warms me up right. as somebody coming from the outside to hear that. That's like, well, that's pretty fucking cool. It's, I, I think, you know, commemorative plaques are the go-to in a city like Florence for talking about marginal histories. You know, so this person wrote a book in this house. That's the classic thing. Um, it's one way of speaking to history and because i'm sorry can i can i jump in let's yeah. not take it for granted please i'm not taking it for granted maybe i'm crazy let me know uh -huh. in europe united yeah. states north america yeah. whatever there's not a whole lot of public monuments dedicated no. to black people no and, and most I mean, people shit, don't know he's black is that so, fair to put on the table <laughs> that's that's fair okay that's fair and and but most people don't even know he's black and i think that might i mean he, they know he's an important resistance fighter um they know there's a brigata named after him and that's probably what got that plaque up there you know, uh, it's it's taken, no. <laughs> but it's taken it's taken a long time for people to actually start talking about the fact that it's not just important that he was a partigiano, a resistance fighter. It's important that he was black, and he wasn't the only black resistance fighter either, right? And so, I mean, it's crucial. What what is this? I mean. I, so you all have to know, you don't know this about me, or some of you know this about me, I have great issues with ideas of permanence. Um, my, there's a building that just got named after my grandfather and after George Floyd was murdered, and I'm not happy about that either, just in case y'all like, there's any sort of like lean confusion, no. For me, like, there's a, a, an, an approach to consistent use of, of visual language and materiality usually materials that are extracted directly from the earth through violence um, in an unsustainable way. <laughs> Whether we're talking about marble that's been part of the geological history for hundreds of thousands of years, sometimes millions of years, or bronze that has been buried beneath the earth. Um, the impulse to do you, with the same exact forms that have been the grounding of Western civilization, to use those same forms today to celebrate our heroes, for me, doesn't make sense. Uh, I don't want Harriet Tubman on a dollar bill. I think that does not make sense, right? Uh, that's me. Um, we could talk about what it means to put someone in circulation, but I think it's really confusing circulation. You know, I think it can be confusing to have Martin Luther King Jr. in marble on the mall a place that he wasn't exactly invited to all the time, right? This is not a figure that was loved by everyone in that moment, and we can't pretend that, you know? Um, it's easier for us to digest these histories when we feel like something has been done. It's important for us to see ourselves, very important. And I'm not like saying none of that stuff should be happening, but I think that in the meantime, we have to be looking for other forms. We have to be seeking other strategies for remembering history, for thinking about history. And for me, it's about coming together, first and foremost, right? The March on Washington, that's, that is a coming together that is marking history. And all of those individuals went out. And whatever the hell they went to do, that's a part of their history and they're sharing that. You know, so just the physical being together does it, you know? And it will die quickly if you don't continue to convene. It will die quickly if you don't pass it on to the next person, right? Um, it doesn't have that permanence, right? Um, so, yeah, I think that we can. You said it well, man. I, I wouldn't try to end in on anything beyond that. So thank you for, yeah. for everything, the work, your thoughts, your spirit, your mind, your soul. Thank you all for being here and sharing this space with us and uh, to be continued. Absolutely. Yeah, I love to continue. Well. Thank you, Greg, for coming in here with us. Thank you, Sadi.
for bringing this environment. And thank you, Ilaria, for pulling it together here at the, the Academy. Yeah.